Well, it's good to be with you in the house of the Lord today. Uh, I've been gone for two weekends, and as a pastor, that always feels a little strange. I think one other time uh, I was gone for two weekends when a youth gathering butted up against a, a vacation we had planned. But last week I had the opportunity to be at a, a Camp Luther friend's wedding as their son uh, got married to this wonderful Christian woman. Uh, but my favorite wedding, I have to say, was the one before that, uh, where I was able to walk my oldest daughter, Emily, uh, down the aisle to marry her husband, Ryan, in uh, Minnesota. And, and, and since I have a microphone and control of the slides, I'm going to share with my Redeemer family uh, four quick pictures, okay? So, and I'm sorry if I embarrass anybody in these pictures sitting here today. But there's uh, my daughter, Emily, and my new son-in-law, Ryan, there uh, on their wedding day. Um, This is my bride of 27 years, Pam. We celebrated that on Friday. By the way, do you know what you get your wife on your 27th anniversary? You buy her a dryer. Yes. Because it went out the day before. So that's kind of where we're at in our relationship. Um, One picture of our entire family there. Uh, The other two kids really love Emily because Kyle trimmed his beard, which he did not want to do. And Julia wore a dress, which she did not want to do. So that just shows the depth of their love. And one last one, perhaps one of my favorites, is uh, that one right there. So I know that's not why you came to church, but thanks for indulging me. The reason we're here is to begin, as we did last week, this book study throughout the summer. We're looking at the book of Exodus. And Pastor Daniel uh, shared with you the beginning of the story of Exodus with the birth of Moses. Um, You might remember some of the context, just to review a little bit, that during that time, Pharaoh had ordered the midwives to kill all of the Hebrew uh, boys because the the Hebrews were overtaking the population and he was feeling his power threatened. And and yet Moses' mom put Moses in in a basket and you know how he went into the river and then uh, how Pharaoh's daughter found him and and raised him alongside of Moses' birth mother to become kind of somebody of royalty in the palace of Egypt. And so then Moses grows up and becomes an adult. And one day as he's trying to kind of get back to his roots of his Hebrew uh, lineage, he goes outside and he notices his people being mistreated. In fact, he sees an Egyptian that is beating one of his Hebrew brothers. And so Moses looks to his left, looks to his right, And makes a sinful decision to kill that Egyptian. And then not only kills the Egyptian, but then buries his body in the sand to cover up his capital crime. And from that time forward, Moses' life changes. A couple days later, people are talking and whispering about how he's got this rap of having murdered somebody. And so he knows he's found out. And so from that time forward, Moses goes on the run. And that's what brings you up to this part of the narrative that we're in in chapter 3, where we find out that now that Moses is on the run, he finds himself settling down and tending the flock of Jethro. Jethro's his father-in-law. Jethro's the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness where he comes to Horeb, known as the Mountain of God. Now let's talk about that a little bit here. Moses ends up in Midian. What do we know about Midian? Well, the thing about Midian is it's a pagan place where they worship the false god of Baal Peor. Now, you may not know a lot about the false god of Baal Peor, but what I can tell you is the way they worship this false god, uh, I can't go into all the details in church, but it was very immoral. It was, it was very sensual indulgences that they practiced. And so it was not a, a very good way of worshiping. And in fact, what we learn, I don't know if you've ever picked up on this before, but Jethro's father-in-law is heavily involved in this religion because he's the priest of Midian. And so he goes to this place where he's now in a foreign land worshiping with a family that worships a, a pagan god, and, and now Moses becomes a, a shepherd. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a shepherd, but I do have to tell you that in that time, to be a shepherd was not a highly sought-after job. It was a lowly job. In fact, the Egyptians and the Hebrews wrote about how being a shepherd was 
kind of settling, right? And so it's no surprise that Moses becomes a shepherd, right? Because after all, Moses can't pass any kind of background check, right? Because he's a murderer. And so he takes on the flock of his father-in-law. And he comes to the land of Horeb. Horeb, which when translated means wasteland. And boy, was it a wasteland. And and one day he finds himself seeing a really odd occurrence. There is a a bush that is on fire. Now, that's not the odd part of it. It's not strange that there's a brush fire. In fact, there were probably many brush fires in the deserts of Midian, right? In fact, Midian got 1.5 inches of rain per year. I think we got more of that last night, it seemed, right? Right? So this is a very dry tinderbox, and I'm sure it was very often that you see brush fires. In fact, Pam and I were driving back from Wausau last Sunday, and we drove through some of the most incredible rain I've driven through in a while. We got to Ishpeming to the DNR office, and it said, fire danger very high. And I thought, I've been driving for four hours with my wipers flying off the windshield, and I I don't know how it works. Maybe it was still very high, but I said, it's either still very high or nobody wants to grab an umbrella and go out and change the sign, right? So we've gotten some water. I see that Iowa's gotten like 17 inches of rain, but Midian didn't get a lot of rain. And so here's this brush fire. But here's the strange thing about it. As Moses looks at the bush, he sees that though it's burning... It never seems to be burning up. It's not being consumed. And he comes up upon it to investigate further, and he notices that there in the bush is the angel of the Lord. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And then are those famous words that God says to Moses. He says to Moses, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. I love the classic King James rendering of this passage. In the King James Version of 1611, it says, Put off thy shoes, for the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. So as we dive into this story this morning, what I'd like to consider is as we look at God's presence in the burning bush, I'd like to suggest to you three different ways that God is inviting Moses into a relationship with him. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is calling Moses into a relationship and that God continues to call you and me and place that same invitation on our lives as well as we come to know him through our Savior, Jesus Christ. So here's the first thing I noticed, that God invites Moses, first of all, to receive some forgiveness. God invites Moses to receive pardon for his past sins. Moses is is called by God to take off his shoes because the place where he is standing is holy ground. You know, in the summertime when I go out and work on my deer blind, I have to drive through three farmer fields and walk through a fourth one. The farmer who owns that land leases it to a shepherd who has many sheep out there that graze on the land. I've noticed that sheep do a really good job of eating the grass. And as they eat the grass, there's this strange phenomenon that happens. Uh, They leave behind something. Now, it has many different names, but since we are in church, let's call it sheep residue, okay? So there is a lot of sheep residue that is left behind. And so when I get to where I park, I, I, I have like my, my slip-on shoes. I get out very carefully and I put on my rubber swampers and I put the, the shoes back in the truck and I try to walk through the field getting as little sheep residue on my boots as possible. And then when I'm done working on my stand, I come back to the truck, I take off these boots, right? And I put back on my shoes and I put those boots like in the back of the truck because I do not want to drive home with the benefits of being around the sheep residue as I'm driving, right? It's just not a good feel, right? Well, as we think about how Moses was invited to remove his shoes, 
think of the residue of his past. That Moses had walked through the palace of the Egyptian court for many years. And what, he, what had he been a part of in that? What had he had seen in that? De- the shoes of Moses were the ones that were on his feet when he murdered an Egyptian. When he knelt down and buried his dead body. That the shoes of Moses were the same shoes that ran away to a foreign land in shame because of his sin. That the shoes of Moses were the same ones that walked into a pagan place of worship where there were all these depraved worship practices. You see, Moses' shoes had traveled through some dark, broken, ugly, sinful places. And you might say that he carried a lot of residue of his sin on his shoes. And on this day, God says to him, Moses, take off thy shoes, for I have something better for you. You are now in the midst of a God. You are on holy ground, in the presence of a holy God. Moses, in essence, received a sort of forgiveness and freedom and a release from his past sins just as we've received that same pardon from our past at the cross of our Savior, Jesus. The second thing that's inviting to Moses is this idea to reconsider what he sees around him, to get a new perspective on his reality. God tells Moses he's standing on holy ground, which begs the question, where is holy ground? What is holy ground? Let me ask you this, are we standing on holy ground today because we're inside a church? Is holy ground the seminaries where they train the next generation of pastors to lead our churches? Is it holy ground when you sit around your kitchen table as a family and have a prayer as your evening meal? You see, it's a good question to ask, where is holy ground? What? is holy ground. And when we think about it, it's not so much about where it is, but who it is. That when we are in God's very presence, we stand on holy ground. Now here's the thing. Moses thought he was standing on Horeb. Horeb. You can remember as horrible as wasteland. But God says, no, 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 this, this is holy ground because I am with you. You see, whenever God is with his people, there his people stand on holy ground. When his son came, one of the titles that Isaiah gave him is Emmanuel, God with us. And that means because we have Christ in our life, we stand on holy ground. That means that no matter what horrible path you may be walking through today, you still stand with your holy God. No matter what wasteland you may be experiencing, you have a God who is with you and you stand on holy ground. That gives you a new perspective on your current reality and present just as it gave Moses, a new perspective of what was going on in his life. That the same God that stood with Moses, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, sends his son to be with us, that God might be with us always, and that we might have a perspective that no matter where we are, because God is with us, we stand on holy ground. Just imagine how that changes your perspective on things that might be going on in your life right now. And of course, as we've talked about Moses' past, we've talked about his present, you can probably uh, expect that part of what the invitation was is, is hope for the future. You know, I have to imagine that Moses thought his best days were behind him. He was no longer in the Egyptian royal palace. He was no longer even around his people. He probably thought his days were going to just kind of ride out the farmland as a shepherd. And yet God has so much more in store for Moses. He, he turns this fugitive into a deliverer. He turns him into who's going to be a liberator of the entire nation. And God has all these future plans for Moses, which we're going to discover. You just need to come back to church all summer long and hear about it in Exodus, right? Because his best days were not behind them. 
But God had a wonderful promise for his future as well. So as we wrap up our time together, I just want to ask this question as we close. And my question for you is, what kind of shoes do you come here wearing today? Maybe some of you come here wearing work shoes, work boots, right? Maybe you grew up with this idea that the goal of life is to work as hard as you can and get the best paycheck you can and to get the best station in life as you can, to get the best job you can, to get the best promotion you can, right? And maybe some of you have listened to that and have even sacrificed time with family or maybe you've sacrificed time with, with, with God. And you come here today and maybe you've even gotten to that rank and you find out it's not all that you thought it was. And if that's you, God says to you, put off thy shoes, for I have something better for you. Or maybe some of you come here today wearing sandals. I love wearing sandals. I got my sandals on, it means that I'm not working, I'm relaxing, right? I got my sandals on, it means I'm at the beach, right? It's sunny out. And maybe some of you work hard during the week, but you're really working for the weekend, as the song says, right? And when you get to the weekend, that's when the fun starts, and that's when the partying starts. And matter of fact, sometimes on the weekend, too much partying happens, and sometimes people come to church on Sunday, and they feel guilty about some of the things that maybe they did or said on Friday and Saturday because they're just living a party life. And you know, if you come here just wearing those sandals and that relaxation life and that party life, God has a word for you too. Put off thy shoes. I have something better for you. Or maybe you're just wearing boots that have a lot of sheep residue on them. We have a lot of residue in our life that comes from a lot of different directions. And God has a word of grace for you also. Put off thy shoes. I have something better for you. You see, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent his son. And the night before he was crucified, he got his disciples together and he, he removed their shoes. And he knelt down and he washed their feet to show the great extent of his love and to give them an example of how they were to go out into the world and community and love everybody else the way Christ has loved us. And then the very next day, this Savior Jesus Christ found himself standing in a wasteland. He found himself standing in a place like Horeb, a place That was horrible. In fact, it was so horrible that they called it Golgotha, which meant the place of the skull. It was a place outside of the city plagued with death and despair. And yet, standing on that cross, standing in that horrible place, Jesus made it holy. He made it a holy place where we could receive forgiveness and grace as he offered up his hands and feet for the sins that we commit. There at the cross, God removes our sin, our shame, and even the residue of our life, that we might be forgiven and free, that we might be made holy and forgiven children, that like Moses, we might receive pardon for our past, that we might have a redefinition of our present and a promise for our future. To take that joy and that wonderful grace of our God with you this day as we continue to see God working in the life of Moses and through our Savior Jesus, God working in our lives as well. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the incredible things you do, the fact that you display yourself in a burning bush in a mysterious, wonderful, miraculous way. But we thank you even more so, Lord, that as we've come to know you, that you would reveal yourself in a very distinct way through your son, Jesus Christ. And that as Jesus went to the cross, the horror of the cross would become our holy ground. Lord, help us to stand in the cross, to stand on that holy ground, and to claim that identity as your children, and to know you as the God we love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.